Six o'clock news starts right now. And today is the day the bars in Texas are being allowed to reopen and operate at 50% capacity. But in Bear County, Judge Nelson Wolf has not signed off on that happening here, which is required. But bars in Comal and Guadalupe counties are reopening. Our Devin Clark went to New Braunfels and spoke with staff at a bar reopening today on how they plan to keep customers safe. It's been tough, especially with adjusting to making way less money. After months of its doors being closed, Old Ice House bartender Jennifer Hitchens was ecstatic to hear Governor Abbott announce that starting today, bars could reopen at 50% capacity. I've got kids, and so uh, it's definitely nice to be able to provide a little bit more. During the shutdown, many bar owners applied for restaurant licenses to be able to operate at limited capacity. But Jack Isles, who has been managing this bar for 30 years, says that wasn't an option here. We thought about it and we were getting ready to, but we don't have a regular kitchen. In anticipation of reopening, Comal County officials consulted with health officials, mayors, TABC, and law enforcement to develop a strategy to reopen bars. At 2 o'clock today, the doors to this decades-old neighborhood spot reopened. Dwayne Ninman, who's been coming here to Old Ice House for 30 years. I love it. Says it feels like coming back home. It's going to be nice to see all your friends again, and so it's going to be good. And that Old Ice House, there is an outdoor seating area, but all customers who enter must wear a mask. There are also hand sanitizing stations throughout the bar, and social distancing will be enforced. Reporting in New Braunfels, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. And as part of the new guidelines, bars must close at 11 p.m. The daily COVID-19 briefing with the mayor of San Antonio, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, a little over 10 minutes away, coming up about 6:13. Today, Judge Wolf is expected to make an announcement about bars reopening or not here in Bear County. Bear County, meantime, setting records when it comes to the number of mail-in ballots that have been received. Yeah, around 45,000 mail-in ballots for this year so far. That's nearly half of the 99,000 ballots the election department mailed out to voters. On your screen right now, we're going to take a look at a chart comparing this year's numbers to 2018 and 2016. 5,200 more ballots this time around compared to just two years ago. The Elections Department will continue to process and send absentee ballots until October 23rd. Now, as for early voting in Bear County at the halfway point today, the Bear County Elections Department reported more than 18,000 voters. Our KSAT photographers were out checking in on lines for the second day of early voting. Today, we stopped by Kirby City Hall. They had about a 10 minute wait. Windcrest had a wait time of up to an hour and 15 minutes. Those long lines could be due to the 1,375 mail-in ballots that have been canceled, according to the Bear County Elections Office. Some of those include residents who are eligible to receive mail-in ballots. Jesse DeGoyado says, tells us why there are still many apprehensive about using the mail. The heavy turnout so far actually includes voters over 65 who had second thoughts about mailing in the ballots they'd requested, like Katherine Somerville. I had initially asked for a ballot over 60 days ago, but then I changed my mind. Unlike the wait that others have experienced, hers was shorter than most. But once inside the AT&T Center, she had her mail-in ballot canceled. Evidently, uh, it took them uh, like 10, 15 minutes for them to process that for me. After that, Somerville says it took her two minutes to finally vote. It should have been, I think, a little easier than what it is now. The reason for Somerville's change of heart in a word, worry. Worry that a mail-in ballot may not make it in on time, and she's not alone. Many others also have made the switch to vote in person. Definitely wanted to make sure that my uh I have a paper trail for my vote. With everything that, that had been said about the security of voting and so forth, we just decided this would probably be better than mail-in. Another alternative to mailing the ballot would be to drop it off at the elections office. But if you don't want to use it at all, then just tell the elections judge at any polling site who will then call in to cancel the ballot. How do you want to reassure them that their ballot will not be double counted? What kind of safeguards does the elections office have? It's very easy. Every voter has a voter registration number. But whatever you decide, says voter James Wilson. You know, vote regardless of how you do it. Just do it. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. In San Antonio, not the only major city in Texas seeing long early voting lines. This is video from Houston. The Harris County Clerk's Office reporting more than 100,000 votes on the first day. Their highest early voting turnout 
ever. And then check out this view from Dallas. You can see people masked up waiting in lines to cast their vote. Nearly 60,000 people voted in Dallas County on the first day. More than 42,000 in Tarrant County, which includes Fort Worth. And in El Paso, lines are packed with people trying to vote early. That area says more than 33,000 votes were cast yesterday between mail-in ballots and in-person voting. That is another record high turnout. And remember, early voting lasts longer this year. You can vote early through October 30th this week. Voting hours will be from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. through Saturday, then noon to 6 p.m. on Sunday, then beginning next week. Early voting will be extended by two hours, closing at 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and then noon to 6 p.m. on Sunday. And for a list of polling locations or details on what you need to have with you to be able to vote in person, head to our website at ksat.com and click on the Vote 2020 tab. The plans are underway to conduct a virtual civil jury trial here next month following the Texas Supreme Court's approval of those proceedings. It's become a controversial issue with significant pushback from trial attorneys. Here's Paul Venema with a look at what's at stake. An attempt to conduct a virtual civil jury trial here failed last month. The reason? All parties could not agree to the concept, which is mandatory for the trial to proceed. The Supreme Court order does, however, provide for a way around that. They have allowed for individual judges to compel fully virtual civil jury trials um, if the parties decide not to agree to have one. Ron Hill opposes that and said it's unlikely it would happen. The virtual civil trial idea was designed to resolve some of the trial backlog as a result of the pandemic. Ron Hill feels that's not the answer to the problem, which is also the position of local members of the American Board of Trial Advocates. What is the downside of a virtual civil jury trial? Most of our membership thinks that it would be very difficult to get a true measure of justice from a virtual jury panel. In this letter to Runhell, the organization also cited constitutional concerns. The Constitution guarantees us a right to a jury trial of our peers, uh, but it also guarantees an open court. In the letter, Peary noted that 90% of the board's membership are opposed to being forced into virtual civil jury trials. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. A teen involved in a police chase in Castle Hills might also be connected to a burglary in San Antonio. That chase began this morning when officers caught up with him after he crashed in a neighborhood on Vance Jackson Road near I-10. Katrina Weber with the details. In an instant, a small SUV did what several Castle Hills police officers had been attempting to get the teenage driver of this compact car to stop. Police say it matched the description of one in an overnight burglary. And just before 5 a.m., he took off when they tried to stop him. I mean, what, what, wait, wait a minute. I saw a car going like 100 miles an hour. And then two cops right behind him. Ricky Jimenez caught the tail end of it from a bus stop on Vance Jackson Road. Police say when the 17-year-old turned onto Greenhaven, he hit the SUV belonging to a man delivering newspapers. No one was hurt. At one point, police thought they had that driver cornered on this dead end street, but they say he still was able to slip away by going right through that ditch. They did something out the window. The police came down the road. They had the lights. They went all the way back down to the alley where he came through. Police say the driver had tossed out a gun. They spent some time searching but didn't find it. Inside the car, they found a 27 year old woman who the teen told them he had just met and picked up. Police questioned her, then let her go. They did something out the window. The police came down the road. They had the lights. They went all the way back down to the alley where he came through. After this fast chase, the driver is facing charges, most likely including burglary. Police say he had some stolen items with him in the car. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic now. Let's take a look at the camera here at I-35 at Randolph. You can see it's a slow going right here as the on-ramp connects with the main lanes of I-35 in this direction. But uh, headed the opposite way, looks like things are moving smoothly. And as we look at live cam, today was warmer. It was. Yesterday I could kind of tell there was a lack of humidity. Today really, you know. We're going to appreciate that cold front once yes, it gets we will. here. Yeah, and don't expect immediate 
changes with the cold front. It's tomorrow night into Friday where you're really going to feel the effects of that front. But let's talk about everything. We could use some rain with the front. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll squeeze a whole lot of moisture out of the clouds in the coming days with the cold front. Aquifer down three tenths of a foot. We're about four and a half feet below the October average. Mold is moderate, ragweed on the low end. So we topped out at 92 degrees today. So we were about 10 degrees above average for this time of year. That will be changing but give it some time. It's another warm day tomorrow. Low 90s for the most part right now from 89 in Bulverde to 95 in Castroville, 91 in Tarpley, Del Rio still at 96, San Antonio measuring 91 degrees at the International Airport. Clear this evening, increasing humidity, low clouds and fog developing by early tomorrow morning. So we're going to start our Thursday with reduced visibility. So anticipate that for the morning commute, 68 degrees. Then by the noon hour, we're up to 90 tomorrow. Cold front hits, temperatures start to slowly fall off tomorrow evening. Most noticeable aspect of the cold front tomorrow will be the wind. For the afternoon and evening, we're talking gusts in excess of 30 miles per hour. So a gusty north wind kicking in tomorrow, and then that drops our morning readings down into the 50s. And I'll be back to show you what kind of impact that front's going to have to our afternoon high temperatures coming right up. Just about time now for the daily briefing on coronavirus cases here locally. As we mentioned earlier, we are expecting to hear the county judge talk about the possibility of reopening bars here locally. Metro Health and oversees community health and violence prevention divisions of the Metro Health Department. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 132 new cases of COVID-19 since yesterday. Our new seven-day moving average is now 126. Thankfully, we do not have any new deaths to report this evening either, uh, but we know this, uh, the toll from this pandemic has been great, so please continue to keep those families and friends in your, in your prayers. Tonight, there are 193 patients in the hospital with COVID. That's up three from yesterday, and we had 28 new COVID-19 related admissions to the hospitals over the last 24 hours, and this evening, we have 80 patients in the ICU and 39 patients on ventilators. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. And uh, we still seem to be heading overall in the right direction. Uh, as you know, um, the governor has given the county judge the authority to do uh, open bars or keep them closed or whatever. And close to co consultation with Mayor Nuremberg, we've been talking about it. And then also with Metro Health, um, I came up with a decision. Uh, first of all, uh, there are uh, 3,000 bars roughly in the, uh, in the community. Out of those 3,000, about 425 have not opened. The ones that have opened, opened up more like a restaurant under the Texas Alcohol and Beverage Commission because they're serving food. So you have 425 that chose not to serve food or maybe, they, maybe they'll never open. I don't know. So what would it be presenting is uh, to those bars that will not serve food, this is a uh, timeline and, 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 and the regulations that we'd like to see put in place. Um, the Tex uh, Metro Health, along with their uh, advisory committee, has recommended, um, I think it's eight different um, uh, recommendations that, that, that they think are important to for the safety of their customers in the bar as well as to their employees. Uh, these eight recommendations, uh, I've accepted all of them except for the ones that says uh, limited to, to outside because that contradicts the governor's order and we can't contradict. These are all items that are um, uh, above what, what, what the restaurant bars are doing today and the way we're approaching it, it would be a mandatory requirement, not a recommendation, and one that would be enforced. Um, uh, and and they are they are um, uh, prohibited standing and, and are congregating indoors while waiting for a table and creating a six foot distance. Ensure that ventilation systems operate properly and increase circulation of outdoor air as much as possible require the patrons to wear a face mask consistently and correctly, if not actively eating, drinking, or included, including while dancing, keep tables and other seating areas at six foot apart, prohibited the seating of different parties at a common table, 
and prohibit ordering, seating, or congregating at a bar service level. Now, these are all recommendations that were brought forward by uh, Metro Health and their committee. So, the order will say that you can open up on certain day, and I think it'll be early next week because we have to do paperwork. We have to provide the uh, actual emergency order tomorrow as the lawyers look over it very carefully. And so it'll probably be early part sometime next week uh, before it took place. Um, I believe the governor will support this. Uh, it's additional safety measures, none of which are, um, you know, onerous uh, or, or would be unfair to the bar owner. Uh, so we're uh, going to take that step and get it filed tomorrow and take effect sometime probably the early part of next next week. Uh, the other step that we're taking, uh, we're going to be meeting in the commissioner's court next Tuesday and uh, talking about grants that we could make to the restaurant and to the bar industry. Uh, we've already provided $11.5 million in grants to 850 different businesses. It's some of them are restaurants, some of them were bars, but we all know they've struggled the most. So we're going to come up with another $3 million and limit it to restaurants and bars. There'll be grants up to $25,000. It would apply only to locally owned restaurant and bars, up to $5 million in gross revenue and up to 60 full-time or part-time employees in the restaurant or bars. This is all subject uh, to the approval of the commissioner's court meeting. It will be meeting next Tuesday. Uh, I believe there will be support for it. Uh, this will be presented by the staff uh, next week. So that will help them in their transition to get, op get back open again. So we're going to take those steps, and uh, I think the mayor and I are in accord with the uh, way of doing that. Huh? Great. Thank you, Judge. And as always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 and the assistance that's available to people in need. Uh, housing assistance, if you are unable to pay rent or mortgage, we have an emergency housing assistance fund set up for you. You can go to the website at covid19.sanantonio.gov. Also, if you've been out of work, if you've been displaced from income and from your job because of COVID-19, we have a job training program available to you to learn skills for jobs that are available today in high-wage in-demand careers careers. Uh, while you are training, you will also receive a stipend to help pay rent, mortgage, keep food on the table, keep bills paid, etc. Get more information on that program by calling 210-224-HELP. Again, that's 210-224-HELP. And you can get the latest on the COVID-19 health aspects by texting COSAGOV to 55000 or going to the website covid19.sanantonio.gov. Uh, all right, that's the news right there. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf saying that Bear County and San Antonio bars will be open next week, will be allowed to open next week. There are some safety recommendations. He's going to file an order tomorrow. He expects it will take place sometime early next week. Uh, some safety recommendations are also put in place there. In addition, he will have the commissioner's court talk about issuing grants for bars and restaurants that are locally owned. And he again talked about that would be three million dollars up to the court to approve that. He did start out that explanation by pointing out there are three roughly three thousand bars in San Antonio, 425 or in Bear County, rather 425 have not reopened because they're not selling food. A lot of bars adapted that way in order to uh, open up after the governor allowed. So uh, that's something to look for next week. He said that emergency declaration would not be in effect until at least early next week. As for the local numbers in terms of COVID 132 new cases, but no new deaths to report today. And the county judge acknowledging that the bar and restaurant industry in our community has been hit hard. He said there are 425 bars that this would affect, but some of them may not be able to reopen because of the economic hardships. All right, let's switch over to weather right now, and we are waiting on a cold front. And after today, and the heat, <laughs> we're even more eagerly awaiting yeah. that cold front. Yes, Bring it on. We uh, a lot of folks are really looking forward to a cold front. It's going to be a real deal cold front, but its effects are just going to last over the span of a couple of days. We're go going to go from this flip flop, short sleeve and shorts weather to long sleeves and pants back into this kind of weather. Just some ups and downs here in the days ahead. So let's get right to it. Looking outside, a lot of sunshine out there, just some high clouds streaming overhead. Should make for a decent sunset. 91 degrees right now. That's down one degree from our high temperature and a dew point of 61. So feeling a little bit of humidity in the air, but that humidity will be increasing tonight, and that's going to lead to some fog tomorrow morning. Across the state, you don't see the cold front yet.
It's not in Texas. 95 in Lubbock, Amarillo even at 92, neighboring Guymon, Oklahoma at 90, you have Oklahoma City 87. But then you get farther to the north and there's that boundary. Temperatures in the 50s and even 40s on the cool side of that front. We're talking 48 in Bismarck and 58 in North Platte. So that's the cooler air that's plunging southward. The core of it is going to stay across the northern tier of the US, but it's a big enough air mass where we're, we'll get clipped by it. And look what happens to our afternoon high temperatures. Friday, we're not even going to crawl out of the 60s. We'll have low clouds, a gusty breeze, a few spritzes and sprinkles, and 67 for the high temperature. By Saturday, we start to rebound back into the 70s with some sunshine, and then Sunday, well, right near 90 and humid. Okay, so here's the breakdown tomorrow. Low clouds and fog around the morning commute, 68 degrees, and then some sunshine. We'll make it to 90 degrees tomorrow. So yes, the cold front's coming tomorrow, but don't expect it to be a cooler day. Still right up near 90. The most noticeable aspect of the front tomorrow is going to be the wind for the afternoon and evening. The wind will be out of the north at 20 to 25 with gusts in excess of 30 miles per hour. You get into Friday, still breezy. I mentioned those cooler readings Friday morning in the 50s, Friday afternoon only in the 60s. Saturday will start the day at 53 and only make it up to 78 in the afternoon. Then if you love the humidity, it's back on Sunday. <laughs> He highlights the weekend because he knows that's what we're looking at. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right, so last week we were talking about a lot about the NFL and COVID-19. It switched over to college at yeah, this point. It's hit hard in Florida, and after the Gators played A&M this past weekend, there's concern now in College Station about those tests. We told you first of five that Nick Saban has now tested positive for the coronavirus, so now the Gators are forced to shut down their facilities, and now their game has been postponed against LSU, the latest on the outbreak, and the Longhorns' run game must improve if they're going to get a win coming up. after losing their first game of the season as the fourth-ranked team in the nation of the fight in Texas Aggies. The Florida Gators are going to be forced to call out their next game against LSU after as many as 19 players tested positive for the coronavirus. Florida Athletic Director Scott Strickland says there are less than 50 scholarship players who are currently available, and we've reached a point where we don't think it's appropriate to play the game this weekend, forcing officials to postpone the game. Head coach Dan Mullen is now apologizing for his suggestion that they should have packed the swamp this Saturday after losing to the Aggies 41-38, saying the fans at Kyle Field were a factor. Meantime, the Aggies who are not reporting any positive tests as of today are preparing for the Mike Leach air raid offense of Mississippi State. You may remember upset defending national champion LSU in the season opener 44-34. But since that big win, the Bulldogs have lost two in a row to Arkansas and most recently Kentucky. One reason why the Aggies are six and a half point favors, even though they haven't won in Starkville since 2012. Another is that Kellen Mond has become the first Aggie to two years to be named the SEC Offensive Player of the Week after becoming the Aggies all-time leading passer in school history in the 41-38 upset of Florida. His teammates know why. Kellen is, um, he's grown a lot. He has grown a lot, and I knew he had it in him to uh, have that performance, and I'm glad he did it, and we really needed it. He's a, a leader, a very vocal leader, and he has so much passion for the game, so I'm so happy to have him as my quarterback. All right, kickoff in Starkville on Saturday, except for 3 p.m. Following another outbreak of COVID-19 in the Baylor football program, their game against Texas one week from this Saturday may be in jeopardy. That's after the Bears had to postpone their game against Oklahoma State. That was originally set for Saturday in Waco. The Longhorns could use the extra week to improve their, after dropping back here to back games in the Big 12, including Saturday's four overtime loss to the Sooners in the Red River rivalry. One thing that must improve is the Longhorns' run game. When you take out Sam Ellinger's 242 yards on the ground, the Longhorns as a whole have only rushed for 474 yards total. It starts with the offensive line. Line that has allowed six sacks against the Sooners. Head coach Tom Herman is well aware of that. Got to run the ball better. And we all know that, um, and we've got to find ways uh, to to help our offensive line. Uh, did not handle uh, Oklahoma's uh, movement of their defensive line real well. Uh, they were you know, twisting and, and moving pretty much every snap, and uh, that. Uh, was difficult for us and we need to do a better job uh, with that. If the game against Baylor is still on one week from this Saturday, kickoff in Austin is set for 2.30. UTSA head coach Jeff Trailer is forced to make a change of safety this week against Army. That's after Rashad Wisdom will have to sit out the first half after receiving his second targeting call against BYU this past Saturday. Trailer has told us he has spoken to Rashad about the incident, even recounted an unfortunate incident, as he called it, when he was an assistant coach for leading with your helmet. If you
He needs to see what he hits. You know, he's got to get his face up and see what he hits. I love the way he plays, how hard he plays. and He's such a great leader. We, we need to keep Rashad safe, and we're coaching that, and Coach Nix and Coach Lepp, all of us are, are, are trying to reach him to let him know that we want him to be a, a great father, a, a great friend and husband one day. And there's life after football. Kickoff against Army in the Alamo Dome this Saturday is set for 12.30 p.m. a little earlier than normal. And again, we'll repeat what we told you first at 5 and just a little while ago, that Nick Saban has now been sent home. He is self-isolating for the time being as a head coach of Alabama. It will continue on right now. The game, they're telling us, is still on against Georgia at this time. All right. And the big question is, is there anybody else in that program? They're that going to test positive. everyone again tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. The pandemic continues to wreak havoc across the country. Some states seeing record COVID-19 cases. This is Congress continues to battle over a stimulus deal that feels nowhere in sight. Daryl Forges with the details. The map says it all. No state is trending in the right direction. 36 states like Colorado reporting a spike in new cases. We really do have to get back to the basics with regards to our battle against the COVID and uh, do what we can to bring down these numbers because they are alarming. Alarming to health experts as well. We don't have this uh, pandemic, this epidemic under control. CDC Director Dr. Robert Redfield says the rise in cases is due in part to small household gatherings. And particularly with Thanksgiving coming up, we think it's really important to stress the vigilance of these continued mitigation steps uh, in the household setting. There are reports that some in the White House are advocating for herd immunity. Many health experts believe that could be dangerous. If you allow this virus to spread as they are advocating, we are looking at two to six million Americans dead, not just this year, but every year. As the war on COVID-19 continues, the battle over a stimulus deal to provide relief drags on, with some House Democrats urging Speaker Nancy Pelosi to accept a proposal made by the White House and Republican leaders. What I am trying to say, and a lot of members believe, is that what is unacceptable is to, for us to go away uh, with no deal. But Pelosi says the proposal does not do enough. I know what their needs are. I listen to them, and their needs are not addressed in the president's proposal. I'm Daryl Forges reporting. The former President Barack Obama plans to hit the campaign trail for Joe Biden in the final stretch of the election. President Obama will campaign next week and intends to focus on early voting states. He plans to visit a handful of critical battlegrounds where voting is underway. The former president's schedule has not been finalized, but stops in Florida, North Carolina, and Wisconsin are being considered. The events will be socially distant and designed to draw local media coverage. As the U.S. continues its exploration of deep space, it's committed to avoiding conflict up there. Seven nations, including the United States, is signing what's called the Artemis Accords yesterday. It's a set of principles to guide space exploration and promote cooperation among nations working with NASA. Some other countries who signed the agreement, Australia, Canada, Italy, Japan, and the UK. The Artemis Accords reinforce the, and implement rather, the 1967 agreement known as the Outer Space Treaty. 91 out there right now, and we know we got some changes headed our way, and we know we have to be patient about those changes. But, I, you know... Did you bring down the high temperature on Friday a little bit? Yeah, we did. We think that's it's going to be thought. even cooler than we previously expected. And that's mostly a result of the low clouds really sticking around on Friday. So we're not going to get much in terms of sunshine and help from the sun as we get into Friday. So it's going to be a day where you'll want the pants and the long sleeves, not the shorts and flip flops like what we've had. So areas of fog developing tonight and for the morning rush hour tomorrow. Then the cold front will arrive tomorrow early afternoon, but the changes will really take effect on Friday. That's when you'll really notice those changes. So let's talk about temperatures, dew points, winds, how it's all going to be changing here over the next 24, 36 hours. All right, right now we're 91 degrees, just one degree lower than our high today. Dew point is 61. So a bit of humidity in the air and the humidity is increasing. You look at the current readings, it's not oppressive, but watch as we go through the night with our future cast. These dew points rise with that wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico and tomorrow we'll start the day with dew points. I think upper 60s to near 70. 
70 and that's going to help lead to some areas of fog and low clouds. But the dew points they get swept away just for a couple of days. This cold front's only going to impact our weather for about a two day period. That's where you'll notice the changes with it. Then it's back to what we've been experiencing. Let's talk temperatures 96 now Del Rio 95 Catula. It's unseasonably warm 91 here San Antonio and Gonzales here 89 along with Pleasanton. All of Texas for the most part in the 90s and some areas in the upper 80s. Dallas 88 and Alpine right now at 89. There's the cold front. It's off to the north of us. Basically just moved through Denver. Some 50s and 40s on the cooler side of that boundary. And that cold air mass is just going to clip us. And as I said before, affect us for a couple of days. But look what it does to the high temperatures. It really has an impact on them from 90 tomorrow to 67 on Friday. So we're going from basically shorts and short sleeves down into long sleeve weather just like that. And then Saturday we start to rebound in the 70s and by Sunday it's back to what we've been experiencing right near 90 degrees and the humidity is going to be back on Sunday. So over this four day stretch, there's going to be a big temperature roller coaster that's on the way. Let's talk about rain chances right now. There's some moisture and precip associated with that cooler air mass across the northern tier of the US. But unfortunately, we don't have a lot of moisture to tap into once this cold front arrives. So for us around here, I think we'll squeeze out a few sprinkles or light showers, but that's going to be it and it's going to be isolated and not really significant. Here's our future cast 7 AM tomorrow morning, low clouds and some areas of fog. We get into the afternoon, we'll have some sunshine. That's when the cold front arrives with that front. If we're lucky, we'll squeeze out a few showers, but I think there'll be very few and far between. And on Friday with the low clouds lingering, a few spritzes and sprinkles, brief isolated showers possible, but again, not really significant in any way, not really a drought denting situation there. Just a few uh, isolated little light showers possible Friday. So 68 in the morning tomorrow, still near 90 before the front arrives and then windy tomorrow afternoon. One of the biggest changes you'll notice tomorrow for the second half of the day, the wind's going to be strong. We're looking at gusts in excess of 30 miles per hour out of the north. Then Friday morning in the 50s, Friday afternoon we will be in the 60s. It looks like so a real fall like day there and then Saturday's going to be great from 53 in the morning to 78 and sunny in the afternoon. Put those uh, Halloween decorations out and it'll be very <laughs> pleasant to do so. My wife's not a big fan of inflatables. <laughs> yes, we've talked about so that. Yes. that's why I like to put them out. Yeah, that's why I like to put up some inflatables every once in a while, you know. Yeah, that sounds very familiar. <laughs> I've had that conversation in my house. Yeah, <laughs> I think we have Mayor Ron Nuremberg. He'll join us after the break. In our Wednesday KSAP Q&A, we are joined by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg to answer some big questions about issues facing the city right now. Mayor, thanks for being with us. Uh, we want to start with the big announcement about bars today. We know that um, the judge said that he is now opting in under certain conditions to the governor's order allowing bars to reopen. That's expected to hopefully happen sometime next week. Uh, he said that you all were really in accord about this. We know that bar owners, employees, so many others have been suffering while their doors have been closed. So why is this the right move, not only for them, but for where we are when it comes to COVID? Well, first of all, the conditions within the community have to be closely monitored. And right now we're at a level of infection that has really been brought under containment. And that's, every, that's because everyone has been mindful of the public guidance. And we've been thoughtful as we've been making decisions about moving forward and opening events and different facilities. Some events and some facilities are a little bit harder to manage be just be by nature of the behavior that we see in them and, and the kind of operations that they are. Uh, and so th the reason why I think that this is going to be successful is that if we maintain focus on behaviors and operations as opposed to particular places, we can focus on the things that we need to do to make sure uh, that it's done safely. Uh, so just like the mask mandate that was put on uh, businesses, and, and one of the reasons why we were able to conduct that is that we, businesses had to adopt the mask mandate on behalf of their customers, uh, we, are allowed to, we were successful in opening businesses up with that mandate. Same thing here. B uh, bars uh, that agree uh, or bars that comply with the guidance that has been offered by the public health professionals in terms of 
distancing uh, in terms of seating uh, uh, people who who are um, not multiple parties together, no service standing, no service at the actual bar. You have to remain seated. Uh, it, it, mask ma mask wearing. So as long as we are mindful of those public public guidance, uh, public health guidance, uh, we'll be able to do this safely. They will be enforced. These are mandatory measures that have, be, have to be put in place. So if everyone is mindful of these things and cooperates, we feel like this can be successful. Talk about schools. There are a lot of the big districts that are saying they're going to allow kids that want to be in school to come back next week. Along, they'll still offer the virtual learning, but they also are allowing people to come back. Your thoughts on that? You know, we're right on the edge. We're right on the edge. Last week, we dipped below 5% positivity rate. This week, we, we dipped or, or we uh, came back up a little bit. Very small deviations, but we're above 5% right now in terms of positivity rate. So the recommendation is that in-person learning is limited to small pods of students, no more than six per, per uh, pod. And so we have occupancy at 25%. That's still the public health guidance. Whether it's bars or schools, I think it's the right thing to do to follow the public health guidance, and that's what I would recommend. Uh, hopefully by next week we see that positivity rate again come down. But everything is dependent on you know how much this virus is transmitting, how well we can uh, regulate our own behaviors within certain facilities. So you know the schools that are having six people in their class, or, or schools that go um, you know even beyond that. It's going to be really incumbent upon them to make sure that safety protocols are put in place in those facilities. Mayor, hang with us for one more segment. If you can, we're going to take a quick break. Back with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg in our KSAT Q&A. Mr. Mayor, you know, I'm a big advocate of people voting. I don't care who they vote for, just so they vote, vote don't silence your voice. But we're seeing a lot of long lines out there. Are you at all concerned that it's taking people so long to vote? Um, no, <laughs> not yeah. really. Uh, it just shows you how important people believe the, their right and their privilege to vote is. Uh, I do know that the county has made some adjustments based on the demands, uh, the, the volume of people they've seen at certain sites. I think those kind of adjustments are going to be helpful in reducing the weight. But look, this is the most important thing that we can do uh, to make our voices heard in the government and electoral process. And, you know, some people have been waiting years to cast this vote. And, you know, uh, an hour or so is not going to slow them down. I will say if uh, folks want to reduce that time, scout around. Uh, one of my colleagues told me there was no wait at Our Lady of the Lake, which is a brand new uh, polling site. So I went down there. I voted in 15 minutes. So depending on where you go, there's going to be a little bit of a wait. But the county has done a great job with safety mechanisms, with the, you know, considering we're still in a pandemic and also helping to adjust to make sure the wait times are reduced as we move forward. Yeah, I also think we have some of that information on our website where you can get kind of the busiest oh, sites good. and maybe good places to go to vote. Yeah, yeah, some people waiting just minutes, but other people waiting several hours around yeah. town. So you were out and about. You said you voted yourself. Were you expecting the kind of turnout we saw on the very first day of early voting? You know, kind of. I was. I, I know there's been such a pent up um, you know, excitement for this election for so many reasons, from the top of the ballot to the bottom of the ballot. Uh, people are ready to get out there and, and let's do this. Let's go vote. I mean, we've been talking about it for years uh, on the local side. We've been talking about it for months, if not years. So, you know, people are excited. I, you know, the long lines are, are inconvenient, but the long lines illustrate that this community is excited about this election. There's optimism and hope for the future and people are casting ballots to make sure that that hope comes to fruition. San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg, as always, appreciate your time. We'll see you tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, y'all. We'll be right back. How would you like to watch penguins 24 hours a day from the comfort of your home, or at least have the option? Well, thanks to a partnership between SeaWorld San Antonio and KSAT, the live penguin cam is up. Roughly 250 birds will be ready to have their 15 minutes of fame. This includes species of penguins, including King Gentoo, I hope I'm saying that correctly, okay. Chin Strap, and Southern Rock Hopper. I think you just made the last one up. But anyway, you can watch the penguin <laughs> cam on our website at ksat.com. 
I'm kidding. Myra wouldn't do that. It's <laughs> under both the KSAT TV page and KSAT Kids or on our free streaming apps. I could watch this for a while. And look, even this handler cam now. <laughs> Penguin Wrangler cam. Hey, if I came up with that name, by the way, that was very good off the cuff. That's true. You I'm, did a great I'm not job. that good. Yeah. We'll be right back. <laughs>